Foundation 45 is a 501c3 nonprofit that funds counseling services for mental health, addiction, and suicide survivors. In addition to providing services, it works to break the stigma surrounding these topics. Foundation 45 recognizes that musicians, artists, and creative types are often at a higher risk for issues with mental health and addiction. The organization's goal is to serve the Dallas-Fort Worth creative community by providing free, top-tier mental health and recovery services. You can learn more about Foundation 45 at foundation45.org. Foundation 45. Live fast, die old. I'm Andrew Sherman. I'm a Texas transplant who has always been in pursuit of art as a career. I've played in bands, pursued an acting career in Hollywood, but I found it behind the lens of a camera here in Dallas, Texas. I was born in New York, I've lived in Chicago, Los Angeles, Austin, but I love Dallas. There's a magical artistic scene in Dallas that mostly goes unnoticed to the outside world. This podcast is focused on what makes it so special and the people who make it thrive artistically. If you don't live here, and even if you do, you might not have heard of them. This is the Dallas Famous Podcast. So who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you are? Who you gonna be? Who you gonna be when you are? For us, yeah. This week on the Dallas Famous Podcast, we have the one and only Matt Hillier. Matt the Cat is best known as being the frontman for the legendary band 1100 Springs. We stroll through his history, starting with an alleged busking incident, and we get all the way to his current solo album, Bright Skyline. Matt is totally candid, and we get a really good glimpse into his early playing days and what it was like in Dallas then. We even get him to play a song in the studio from his latest album called Even an Angel. I really enjoyed this chat, and I know you will too. Here he is. We are here at the Deep Ellum Community Center once again with Matt the Cat Hillier. Yeah. How you doing? I'm good, man. This is a cool spot. Yeah, really cool. Deep Ellum Community Center. It's, it's still growing, developing, but they're figuring stuff out. And uh, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, when you told me where it was, you know, we do it from the Deep Ellum Community Center, I'm like, that's something I, I haven't heard of before. Yeah. No, it's new. And I was just talking to an archivist here, and she's saying that like it's not as archived as it should be so mm-hmm. she was telling me how i can go come talk to her and like get some of my photos like at the library copywritten and i don't know show like you know document the history I'm yeah gonna, i'm gonna tell jason janik about that too um but let's start with this i was at your uh record release show kessler which was fantastic thank you um i wish i had her name but there was an older woman and i'm just hanging out in the audience and she was like so i was i'm a huge blues music fan i love music and it was years ago and i was going to a show i forgot who she said and there was this 10 year old kid standing on a coke box singing and playing his heart out and i didn't make it to the show because i just kept watching him and that was you <laughs> <laughs> do you know who i'm talking about or no but it was eleanor maybe or? i don't know I don't but know. i mean it's funny because i get when people tell those stories i get younger and younger <laughs> every single time I, oh. I mean i was young i like when i first started playing out live i was probably 12 or 13 okay i don't remember standing on a coke box ever <laughs> but you know like the stories get better you know yeah. with, with time i yeah. was very young there's there's lots of people who have those, you know, kind of uh-huh. stories of like seeing me play at an early age. But were you doing like, were you playing like busking or were you doing clubs? I mean, or? I, I might have done that before in my life, but no, I mean, yeah, you know, I, I usually had people that were musicians would get me up on stage to sit in a lot. Uh-huh, okay. And um, I don't know, maybe I did. I, I know <laughs> that I have before. Sure. Like, but n- never, you know, never like on any kind of regular basis. So. Okay. Well, maybe that's just the one time. You, maybe I, you just maybe. like got, were on a Coke box for like five minutes and that's the moment she it remembers. Look, man, I've done know. a lot of weird stuff in my life. <laughs> and that could, 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 right? could be. Yeah. And my memory is not uh-huh. as strong as it should oh, be. Let's, let's not get into that. Yeah, right. Um, all right. Well, um, so are you from Dallas? Or I'm something? from Dallas. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh-huh. So you started here. And uh, like what, what made you like gravitate towards singing and guitar at such a young age well okay so music was always a big deal in our house music movies um you know literature uh, art we're a very right brain kind of family you know mm. at least most of us anyway <laughs> and and uh so i can't remember a th- christmas or whatever that uh there wasn't some sort of musical instrument that was under the tree oh now, whether we took to it or not, my brother was played drums, and he was a great. He's a great visual artist. Um, and then I played. I started trying to play violin. That didn't take. Um, and then I 
played piano some. I was okay. I don't know why it took me so long to pick up a guitar because that's all I ever really wanted to do anyways, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I finally did, and it just, I don't know, it just made, made sense to me. And um, I started playing, um, and, you know, and writing songs. Uh, well, really, I started singing and, and, and playing. My, my mom always just, she and I would always sing the Beatles songs and stuff mm. coming up and the Everly Brothers and things like that. And uh, she's one that said, you know, you can learn to sing and you can learn to play, but if you can't, if you don't write your own songs, and you, you know what's the point? Huh. You, know, you don't have anything to say. So I started writing my own songs, my own terrible songs, <laughs> and uh, just kept at it. And I just I don't know, I just love it. I put together a little band to play the, the talent show in like sixth grade hmm. or whatever, and and it was a legit kind of band. I don't know that we were very good, but we were a band for sure. Right. Um, and then I just kind of just kept after it. I just I just loved like kind of it just made sense to me. Mm -hmm. Once doing it and being able to pull off a show and have it work, uh, that's some sort of drug, man. Yeah. You oh, know? absolutely. Like, it's not so much it's the crowd reaction, which is a big deal. I mean, when you're a kid too, and you get that kind of positive response, because I, you know, from my school times i wasn't getting any positive response right right <laughs> <laughs> it's all the opposite so finally somebody told me hey kid you're doing a good job uh i loved it and i love you know i just really it's still i still enjoy all that yeah you know? yeah what do, do you remember a, a point where you're like i i'm i'm a decent songwriter like how old do you think you were when you started to like really understand that you were getting it I don't know that I, I have yet. Oh, okay. No, like, no, I, yeah, yeah. that's, you know, sort of a self-deprecating joke. But um, I, for in the beginning, when you have a band, to me, songwriting felt like a means to an end, mm -hmm. you know, because you need to have songs. Right. You got to have your own original songs. So you write songs and that's what you do. Um, I mean, I think it's a, such a double-edged sword really because like most of the times and i write a lot of songs like it's still to this day i'll walk away from a songwriting session and kind of go yeah yeah maybe you know a lot of times sometimes you walk away from going okay that's good mm -hmm. i like that right i feel like we yeah i put put my best effort and you know up today and it's good but when, even when you feel like it's maybe not as good as you you don't know yet. Yeah. Typically, I'll go back and revisit it a, a couple of weeks later and be like, you know, that's not as, you know, you know, meh as I mm -hmm. thought it was. Is it's it just, sometimes that you're like you're like I'm on the fence, and so you give it a chance, and then development of the song is what makes it. I think you have to let it breathe, and editing is a huge part of the whole thing. Right. Okay. And um, uh, I've gotten. I've gotten a thousand times better at actually finishing a song for whatever that means, you know, because it's mm -hmm. never really finished until you, you know, record it. And even then you can go back and change it and you can do whatever you want to. It's a living sort of breathing thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I've gotten better at least at finishing it to the point where it's like, okay, well, that's a realized idea. All of the bones are there. All of the ideas are there. Now, whether I come back to it in two weeks and rewrite this section or rewrite that um at least it's finished it's not so much a situation whereas before i'd have an idea halfway between sleeping and being awake and i'd just keep a notepad by my bed and i'd write down the line and think okay well i won't lose that, that that's my idea that's where i'll start on it tomorrow and i'll wake up the next day and i'm like that looks that's stupid <laughs> right <laughs> you, know you don't know, know where I mean? you were yeah and it's probably not that dumb but it's just this little tiny little blurb of an idea that that is not it doesn't make sense to you the way that it did last night. Yeah. Or just, you know, so sitting down and actually finishing the idea and sketching it out to where it actually makes sense and you know what you're trying to say and you kind of know where it's going to be, I've gotten a lot better at that. Yeah. And it makes all the difference in the world. Yeah, I can see that that's a skill that you develop, that you don't just start born with that. You know? Yeah, well, and I still have little ideas that I'll sketch down, but, but really more than anything, I just kind of try to sit down and... Do, donate a, a set amount of time to really f flesh it out mm. to where you don't just lose it and it's not just some you know thing that's floating out there it doesn't make any sense to you mm -hmm. later on do you remember the first song that you like that you still maybe still play or that you're like okay this is this is playable like i'm not going to lose this one i don't know um yeah 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 and i was real i really didn't know how 
how to to do it that much. So there were some songwriter friends that I had that kind of took me under their wing and sort of showed me um, uh, how this, the inner workings of a song. We, you know, just the the, the structure of you can hear th- songs all your life and you think think you know about it, but until you you actually identify and say, okay, no, verse, verse, chorus, mm-hmm. verse chorus out that's how it typically works sometimes you need a bridge you need to identify the building blocks before you just go start throwing stuff at the wall Mm -hmm. i had yeah i had a song uh that was from one of my earlier bands um one of my very first bands and uh i don't even remember the title of it but yeah i mean i can remember thinking okay well we we can work work with this like this is an actual song that we can learn how to play Mm -hmm. you know now, if you went back and played it for me now, I can remember the first song I ever wrote that no one will ever, ever, ever hear. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, like, like, I, I don't remember it. Uh, <laughs> it was called Pawn Shop Blues. Uh, and it was, all, it was the only thing that I, I knew about was going to the pawn shops to try and buy a guitar that I couldn't afford. You know, like, <laughs> right. it's just, it just a really terrible, stupid song. Uh, but, I mean, that's how I felt about it. That's where you're living. Uh, right? Yeah. yeah. 12 years old it's like uh, every day i'm just like can we just please just go look at the guitars <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? yeah. mom please oh yeah for me it was keyboards at yeah. first but yeah it's uh i i, I think if there's this one keyboard it was the 80s and it was like it had a sampler on it and all this stuff and i just i i always crossed my mind like if i had owned that where would my music uh career had gone you know because it was just a different thing but you know just fun to think about that stuff sometimes yeah right um so we uh Let's try to figure out, like I'm trying to, I like to do the bio. So you're playing like in 12, you're make, making your bands. Like what, like what was the evolution? Like, did you go to school? Did you just get right to work? Yeah. I mean, I, if, if I could have just not gone to school, I think I would have done that. Mm-hmm. I had a little, I had, there was a manager out of Austin that kind of took me under her wing as like a developmental kind of role. Oh, and cool. she was getting people signed labels and um, she worked with Kelly Willis and she worked with the Wagoneers at the time. And she had worked with, I think lone justice. Um, I remember them. Yeah. Uh, she, she was doing good stuff and she kind of took me under her wing. So I would s- stay at her house in Austin and this is on like 13 to 15 or whatever. And um, that was sort of my first, glimpse into like okay there's this is a real business they're they're grooming you to do this and that you need to get out there and play and learn what the hell you're doing mm-hmm. and you know just keep a regular schedule and figure figure it out write write better songs do all it was very it was kind of intense for somebody my age yeah um yeah. were you playing shows when you went to austin down that time yeah yeah i had a band down there okay and uh um so we would we played a lot back then i mean and it was a really good learning experience. And when then that management sort of thing fell through, um, I don't know. We didn't. We we didn't. It just didn't didn't work out. It's mm-hmm. Like so many so many things. Sure. Very uh, educational. But then I went to high school at Booker T. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And um, so and that was great. So you really. I mean, I don't know about Prodigy, but you were showing like skills at that young age. Other people were recognizing, obviously, if you're getting um, Booker T. I was better than most kids my age. Okay. And I think some of it, I don't know, how, like if if you were to ask me to go back and listen to what I was doing on any kind of recording, I don't think it's bad. I just don't think it's particularly remarkable. Right. Um. But it was good. I mean, it was good good enough. Yeah, well, they could and, see that you had the potential, I guess, right? Yeah, and and at least enough tenacity to never, to not disappear, mm-hmm. you know, to keep just say, you tell me I can't do it. I say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. I'm going to play this show. I'm going to do this stuff. And I think that that's a, a huge part of it as well, mm-hmm. you know? So I was, like, I want to kind of get a, to your conversation about, like, your influences, but, like, I've talked to a lot of people from Booker T and you're the only country Americana person mm-hmm. I've met from there that I'm aware of. Yeah. So how was, were you like kind of on an island or was that what you were doing then? Or? It was very, uh, it was interesting because I would butt heads with my guitar instructor quite a bit and he's a great, great picker and uh, teacher and everything like that. But I was already playing gigs, you know, like I right. mean, I was already doing gigs and I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to play this rockabilly music, which... And rockabilly is cool because you can incorporate all the styles, you know, in, into that. It's just this sort of 
melting pot of whatever you, it's not just country it's not just rock it's not just blues it's not just jazz it's kind of all you can play it however you want to play it mm-hmm. so i was able to sort of take what little jazz things that that i would pay attention enough to to learn at booker t um but he but my my guitar instructor was like you need to just focus on this jazz stuff because that's what they're teaching that's their curriculum right, you know what i mean right but I, I don't know. I, I'm sure I was a pain in the butt to deal with. <laughs> I, mean, I think that they probably would like to have sent me back to my home school just because I was just, a, I mean, I was incorrigible in a classroom, just <laughs> terrible f- from the first grade on. But but did you get something out of that other style? I got a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're not, I, the thing is, is I think that it, most of the students would probably agree that you learn a lot from the, your instructors and everything like that. But I feel like I learned way more from being around other talented kids, uh, yes. you know, because okay. you can talk to your peers, your, you know, classmates better than you can. Right. Your, they don't have teachers. any rules they're following. They're just right. living life like you. Yeah. Yeah. They're into what I'm doing. I'm into what they're doing. You learn a lot from each other. And that was great. And I also got, I managed to audition and get into this vocal jazz group and, uh, and, at Booker T, mm. which vocal jazz is not my favorite, you know, like, I mean, it's always kind of, from, from instrumentalists would always kind of look at it like, that's lame, dude. <laughs> Wait, so it's all, there's no instruments, all vocals? No, I mean, you had mm-hmm. accompaniment, okay. but it was just, it was stuff like uh, Manhattan transfer type of stuff, really uh, close, tight jazz harmonies, which for most jazzers, like, you want to be a horn player. You right. want to be in the combo, you know, you don't sure. want to be like doing this, but I tell you what, man, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about singing harmonies and close, really close, tight harmonies because I'm a natural tenor. Mm -hmm. And in those situations, for people who don't know about music, like the altos and the sopranos typically go in tandem sort of with each other, you know, in thirds, you know, fourths maybe sometimes. And then the bass covers the roots and fifths. And then the tenor gets the part that sounds very weird because that's where all those color notes and those jazz notes start to come in. It's right uh, there in the middle. It, it sounds completely, sounds and feels completely unnatural to go to some of these notes sometimes. But like, I don't know, it was really good t- to learn, you know, as a, as a singer, it, it did a world of good for me. Yeah, I mean, and that, I guess, helped you in other bands getting harmonies like dialed in for other yeah, people and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could hear it better. I, I remember some of the my... Uh, mentors that were playing country music and traditional country music, could they could always just hear that third above Buck Owens style or Everly Brothers or whatever? You could just hear it, you know. I'm like, how do you how do you know what to do? Like, what are you? He's like, well, it's usually for a country, it's usually a major third above, and if you get three parts, it's one three five, you know, like. All this is math jargon. It's probably gonna be boring to people. But, <laughs> well, people, but, a lot of musicians are listening to. But um, but. After that, the 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 third above, you know, Don and Buck style was not so hard to hear. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. it just it was it was a very good learning. I love Booker T. I think it's great. Yeah, I need yeah. to get over there and talk to somebody over there. I've talked yeah. to many people that have gone there, but uh, uh, so you, you mentioned it briefly, like your mom when you would sing Beatles and Everly Brother. Like what what other like what was how did you get to your influence? Because you're at Booker T, so you could have easily gone a different direction at that point. Yeah, it's kind of weird because I was into punk rock music. I mean, the Beatles were... The Beatles... Buddy Holly was the first guy that I ever really recognized as a rock star. Because okay. when I was very young, that movie, The Buddy Holly Story, came out with Gary Busey, and I just thought he was cool. Yeah. And my mom's like, yeah, he is cool. He was cool. Like, he's from Texas. He produced his own records. He wrote his own stuff. Without Buddy Holly, there is no Beatles. And the Beatles were like the biggest thing in our house. My mom's like the biggest Beatles fan ever. Oh, wow. Um, but, I mean, we had all kinds of music in the house, from jazz to country to you know blues and, you know, you name it, rock and roll. Were, you, were your parents uh, Texans? Uh, yes, my mother. My dad was from Oklahoma. Okay, so cl- close area. But yeah, on yeah. my mom's side, the, our family's been in Texas since it was a republic. Oh, wow. So, um, so yeah, we, you know, we, we got that going on. But, um, so, I was into punk rock. Because I was into what, whatever my brother was into, and he was into punk rock, so I was into punk rock. And then he took this trip, uh, it was probably about eighth grade, and he took a trip to England. And he came back with, you know, some records, punk rock records, cool, okay, I can dig on that. And then he came back with these Psychobilly records, which was something I had never heard before. 
And um, it's just really this weird, odd blend of punk and rockabilly. And I was like, man, this is cool. No, and mm. nobody knows about this stuff. Do you remember the names of? Oh bands? yeah, uh, the Meteors were a, a okay. big band that that was I loved a lot, and Demented Argo. Those were the two biggest ones. But I, but I just dove down the rabbit hole. And my mother, once again, being super duper cool like she is, she kind of pulled me to the side and said, "Hey, if you like the psychobilly, that's cool. But if you like psychobilly, you should try rockabilly." I'm like, "What? What's that?" You know? It's like, "Well," I'm, and then she took me to her her and my dad's stash of 45s and uh and there was some gene vincent in there and some eddie cochran and of course there's plenty of elvis but a lot of you know just 50s rock you know mm. and uh i just loved it i just loved it i just it's just like going it's like sticking your finger in a light socket for just a second you know? <laughs> right. like i just thought it was really really cool and uh and then getting into like the really early Elvis stuff, that just changed my whole trajectory, period. Huh, interesting. Because I was a closet Elvis fan. I didn't want to tell anybody. Because well, it wasn't cool anymore? Or? Well, yeah, with especially with the guys we were hanging with. They were on to punk rock and stuff. And Elvis, you know, they hadn't revamped his, his image. Like So what we grew up with was this idea and this guy in jumpsuits and right. blah, blah, blah. And made and terrible, and... terrible movies. And yeah. that's kind of what was sold to us. And then I saw some of the really early first TV appearances he did. And I, I just came out just like, hey, look. If you don't like Elvis, you're wrong. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, know what I mean? yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I get it. If you, if you don't like that stuff, fair enough. But but this dude's cool. I yeah. mean, if 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 there ever was cool, I get it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So and I don't know. That just kind of solidified. And then I got into all kinds of right rockabilly right. stuff. That makes sense though, because I mean, and at that... the blues and country, because like you know, very like sort of overthought out. I just said, well, rockabilly is kind of country country blues you know with a rock and roll feel to it so I, then i went down and i started just you know studying blues stuff mm. and country stuff and you know everything in between it's just a real researcher's kind of yeah point of view but it's interesting because i didn't really think of rockabilly as sort of like a hodgepodge of a bunch of different styles mm -hmm. where you get to go this is our genre which really we get to do a hundred genres in that sort of in a way. And most people don't even understand it still. Like, I mean, when, when I was a kid, if you said rockabilly, nobody even knew what it was unless right. you're one of us. Sure. You know, nobody even knew what the word meant. Huh. Now you can say it and people kind of know yeah. what it is, but they still don't know what it is. Cause it's right. not, it's kind of a lot of different things. Huh. I never really thought of you it know? like that. It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of different styles. And even back the guys who were doing it back then, they didn't call it rockabilly. They just, it was, just the way that it came out right nobody set out to do that it was just just sort of happened that way and one guy's version of it is not the same as some other guy's version huh. of it, you know huh, that's wild I, I i guess i gotta spend a little more time i i uh you know i just think of stray cats because that's my era yeah and i don't value further um but you know i realize that he's just taking the torch from what those other guys were doing a lot of it oh he was you know the stray cats i you know they had they had broken up and well, they hadn't broken up, but they hadn't made any records in a long time. And around about '88, when I was just getting into that stuff, they they made another record and came. Uh, man, I, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven, <laughs> you know. Yeah. 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 I got to shoot uh, Brian this last time, and that's that was cool. Very cool. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so your uh, Booker T. Uh, did you have you had bands going during high school? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. did any of those like last after high school? Did you start over? Or? Yeah, uh, well, I, I kind of, after the Austin thing died down, I came back to Dallas, and I didn't have a band uh, for a minute, and then there was a band out of Denton, it was a really kind of garage, garagey kind of really raw rockabilly band, and they had heard my little demo tape, and they hit me up to, to join up, it was called the Red Devils, mm. there's another Red Devils from LA that was more successful than the one I was in, but okay. um, not to be confused. But uh, so I did that for a while, and then me and the bass player Steve, we quit that band and started a band called Lone Star Trio, and that's 
that was um, that lasted for about four or five years. After high school, I just went straight on the road, and we stayed on the road for a long time. Okay, so were you playing locally as well, or mm-hmm. just, like yeah. where, where were some of the places you were playing? Everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> I mean, Dallas wise. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, we played pretty much most of the places that that were around okay. in those times. So your genre, like, it didn't prevent you from playing at Trees or something like that. No, we played everywhere. Okay. I mean, that's one thing that was interesting was because most of the first places that we played to get gigs were. Like the country bars, like there's a place called Naomi's over on Canton Street. And it was just a beer joints, beer joint. Mm-hmm. You know, the people who went there speak of it with reverence. It just was just perfectly awful. <laughs> and I mean that in the best way possible. Sure, it was sure. just, it was like our the musician's clubhouse. North, you know, all the songwriters. That's where I met all kinds of people. Mm. And then there was a place called the Three Teardrops Tavern which was a really, really cool, ahead-of-its-place kind of time over on off Industrial. The neighborhood was really terrible. There mm-hmm. wasn't anything else going on there, but once you walked inside those doors, you're like, oh, my gosh, you're, like, tran- transported into, you know, this, you know, late 60s honky-tonk, and it was just great, but it didn't last. But then, yeah, we played every, we played Clearview, and we played The Trees. We, we played, uh, we did a lot of shows at the Orbit Room, and... Even the Galaxy Club, mm. I th- you know, I was thinking about it. Every time I come down here, it's the, the landscape in this this neighborhood, in particular, has changed so much. It's, you know, since I was kicking around here, and I still do, but like when I was really kicking around here in the '90s, it was different. Yeah. Of course, I tell people like you know when they talk about deep films, like man, if you really wanted to see it, you should have been around in the '30s. <laughs> you know <what laughs> right. I mean? Like absolutely. Uh, yeah. That's what's so cool about this spot. You yeah. Know? It's. That's the reason it's got legendary songs. Yeah. You know? Well, I saw there's a here at the center they have like a film that will run and, and it basically says this is like where all the train uh you know, like all the train hubs were. Mm-hmm. And they were saying that without Deep Ellum, the Dallas wouldn't have been Dallas. It would have just been another smaller town and that really this is the neighborhood that exploded it out. So I don't know. I believe it. Yeah, it's it's yeah. kinda kinda cool. Okay, so yeah, uh, interesting. So you uh so you're playing you're, you're playing these shows with all different genres of bands like you're it's not just you know everybody okay. really Any, anybody like it's very interesting our perspective is to me interesting because I, I mean I was there and um and it still kind of blows my mind when I think about we fit in nowhere and everywhere all the time because mm-hmm. we were we were good in the country crowd we had a lot of cowboy friends redneck type guys were into texas country music and they loved our band and then we started playing you know trees with people like hagfish or you know like um we played a lot of shows with the rev the toadies you mm-hmm. know we, you know ufo a few we we'll love that band <laughs> right did you, did you do you feel like uh you were doing better in tech in dallas or in other areas in dfw like was fort worth like kind or fort worth was part of it and i uh, yeah i think it's important to bring up fort worth because it had its own particular scene that was just was just cool and underground and just i don't know people always talk about they tout austin as the live music capital of the world and it is and i love austin but from from my vantage point what was going on uh in the dallas fort worth area in those times was really really important there's always been really good music coming out of north texas uh and i don't think it gets the credit that it deserves sometimes I agree. Yeah. because i mean people were more bands were getting signed left and right out of dallas fort worth in the 90s than i don't know anywhere else in the state that i can think of yeah i mean to me my perception because i'd lived in austin briefly was that DFW is more people that like this is where we were born and this is where we're doing it. Austin is more like LA where people are coming there as a destination spot like Nashville or something. Yeah, kind of. I was mean, my people impression. go to Austin to to if you're special musicians, you go to Austin because you know there's lots and lots of gigs and stuff like that. But yeah. I think what I witnessed and I don't say one is better than the other, but I what I witnessed up here was that there was a really cool scene happening, mm-hmm. you know, and and people s- supported each other, and the idea that we could go and play as a rockabilly band, go and play, at an- with any of these other rock bands, you know, um, was really really cool, and and then ha- develop friendships and have it have it, but it was a scene, you mm-hmm. know, everybody right. had their, they were, in it to win it, trying to get to that next level, sure, where it's not like. 
I mean, there's still plenty of just bars that are have music seven nights a week that people that anybody's gonna everybody's gonna go jam there twice a week. That's kind of an Austin thing a little bit. It mm -hmm. happens, you know. Mm -hmm. Regular. There's so much music going on all the time. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that you. I mean, it makes sense because you weren't a country band. You weren't an Americana band. You had the edge to you. So mm -hmm. did. It, it was never like sleepy i'm guessing like no that. it was so, a high energy show yeah man. so i could see that that's cool yeah so so lone star trio is that was that that broke up and that then you went on to uh, yeah we got so loud we got so loud as a rockabilly band and it was really more raucous and we were kind of chasing after what the rev was doing at the time mm -hmm. and you know just trying to do more rock shows but it was just really really just too loud for its own good and people a lot of the people uh who we wanted to take interest in us and maybe give us a record deal kind of took a wait and see kind of attitude and we're like well we don't have time to wait and see mm -hmm. so we decided to do like just we were so loud anyways we're like well what if we did like kind of a zz top type of thing and just played hard rock music and just did that and so we tried that for a minute. We could change the name of the band to Strap. <laughs> yeah, and it was loud and obnoxious, and it, it didn't wind up being like, it was like a blend of ZZ Top, ACDC, or Pantera, or so, something. It was very weird, but we were serious. Mm. We screamed at the audience a lot. We got, a, <laughs> even, we got even louder. Wow. And I'm so glad that we did it when we did at the age that we did and particularly before cell phone cameras because <laughs> yes. uh, i'd be done we wouldn't be having this conversation right, right yeah. now yeah there's a you lot know? of people including yeah. me that is glad that that yeah. wasn't around i mean like there's times where i'm like oh it'd be cool like like some of these younger people like their whole life is documented in a good way but you're like yeah but you can't filter out Oh, you can't Everything. wash stuff off, man. Yeah. yeah. There's some things that come back to bite me still, like, uh, that I'm just like, yeah, well, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. You know? I mean, but it's mostly <laughs> we dodged some serious bullets right. on the timing of right. all of that. Well, nothing showed up on my research that was Good. Like, like really Good. crazy. So then, so that kind of did its, ran its course. And then how did, it was 1100 Springs next for you? Yes. So how did that kind of get going? So we, you know, it was really just kind of a an, an happy accident. Um, yeah, Strap was still playing shows. Uh, Steve, my longtime partner, who was in the Lone Star Trio with me and all that stuff, he had, he had quit Strap. And uh, we were looking for something to do uh, um, on, like, the front part of the week, like Monday Tuesday, Wednesdays, just for fun and to, you know, make extra money. Of course, the money really wasn't a factor. So, and we're like, well, you know, we can sort of remember a lot of these country songs that we, you know, we used to play. I bet we could just get a gig and screw around on a Monday night. And so we went to Eight Airs and we started, we took over the Monday night slot. And it was just me and Steve and a guy named Richie Vasquez, a drummer that uh, we've known for a long time. And um, and we we just would just get up there and screw up country songs for a few hours, and <laughs> and then people. What happened was like the it was a Monday night, so it was service industry night. So like all these folks that had been working all weekend in the bars and stuff that were friends of ours and knew us would come to Eight Airs on Mondays because the beer was cheap, you know, the music was okay, and uh, it was like their Saturday night. And it started to turn into a scene, and I think as we got better at the music, it really started to turn into a scene. But it was a beautiful situation. Mm. So for a while, that was that was Eleven Hundred Springs was just a dares Monday nights. Yeah, and then I think we started doing Muddy Waters on Wednesdays. Okay. Yeah, and we just we I don't know we just had it was fun, you know nobody took it. It's always the funnest when you first start, and nobody has to take it seriously. Sure. Once that sort of thing that little germ takes hold and people start taking things more seriously yeah that's it's still fun but it's yeah. not the same yeah well you know expectations and yeah and, you know. no but it was it was just too easy because people because it was just it made you happy you didn't have to take you didn't have to you're not trying to be a rock god or anything or mm -hmm. get signed to a major label or anything like that it's just you just get up there and Play some country songs. Yeah. But as it goes, let's just started writing songs for it. 
Well, we sold enough cassette tapes to make a T-shirt. <laughs> we sold enough T-shirts to make a compact disc, and now we're sitting here. You know? <laughs> right, it's yeah. It's just the way that it goes. When I first came to Dallas, I went to Adair's a bunch, and I remember, like, always just absorbing your snare drum head that was signed from oh, I don't right. know when it was you know yeah. yeah I was like oh this is their spot that's cool um so then okay so then it became a legit band where you weren't just doing covers and you're touring that you start yeah we started traveling around regionally at first and then you know as it goes you just get a thing happened let me say this a thing happened that, that I don't think anybody was expecting in Texas country music specifically the guys that we were looking to that made sense to us were people like the derailers out of Austin and Dale Watson and Junior Brown and all the traditional country stuff but this other thing happened with uh, Pat Green and Corey Morrow and then all the guys up in Oklahoma the red dirt folks mm -hmm. that we didn't under we didn't know about we couldn't anticipate but it exploded in such a way, like in the wake of like Jerry Jeff or Robert O'Keefe, and then you got all these young college kids who were looking for somebody to sort of carry that torch, and Pat was perfect for them. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot, and you know, I can't leave Jack Ingram out of the conversation because you know he's he was really big and certainly kind, all of those folks were really kind to us. And I'll be honest, like that whole scene did not make a lot of sense to us, mm -hmm. just because we didn't we didn't know about it sure i didn't know about it until it was happening for 20 years probably. right but then and all then of I... a sudden because it was so successful then there's all these radio stations that are really trying to get behind this music and see it see it as a movement that it was and lift it up and we're part of that mm -hmm. i don't you know i don't think that we saw ourselves as being part of it but we were and it was I mean, I, I love these people, and I'm so glad that we were doing our thing at that exact moment, just so that we could that we could be part of it and do all these shows. Because all of those folks, Jack and Pat, and you know, uh, all all of the cross Canadian ragweed and Jason Bowen, and these are all great great friends. You name it, we were we were buddies with with all those guys, mm -hmm. even though we felt like we were kind of just a little too different for mm -hmm. some of that stuff. Well, I mean, it sort of carries the theme of when you were. With the rockabilly band playing mm -hmm. with rock, I mean, it's like you're comfortable being, like doing your own thing in a in another situation. Yeah, I guess. don't overthink it. You know, yeah. you're you're exactly where you need to be most of the time, and if you're not, you will know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, right. Somebody will tell you. Right. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what uh, what when did that start? The Adairs the the. Oh, we started uh, playing there in 1998. I think the okay. fall of 1998. Okay, so that was yeah. a good run. And then, uh -huh. I mean, I. I know I shot your last show at Granada, so uh -huh. like I, I mean, there's a lot that goes on in between. I'm sure you've talked a lot about it, but what, like, what is just it just ran its course, or? Well, um, you know, we made like 11 records, and we're we're, we're playing all the time. And around about 2012, we kind of stepped back from traveling as much. We never broke up, but we just kind of stepped back from traveling as much because you can just get burnt out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we were still working. And, uh, and then we, you know, we played all the way up. We did shows all the way up until 2021, which is, and after the pandemic uh, happened, just like so many people and everybody in the world, you kind of step back and reevaluate where you are and what, where you want to be and all this stuff. And I think, I know that Steve looked at the situation and, and kind of said, I don't really want to be, you know, I don't want to be playing in a bar band anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not not for me. To which I'm like, yeah, well, that makes sense. You know, uh, but this is what I do. And um, but I didn't feel really correct about moving forward. You know, with 1100 Springs without them because we put it together. It did, re you know, represented way more than 1100 Springs, really. If you it goes all the way back to the Red Devils and Lone Star Trio and Strap, and then 1100, it's just a lot of water under the bridge. So, and he worked s super duper hard. We both did, and uh, I don't know. I just didn't. It wouldn't have felt right. And I wanted to. I wanted just to make my own records under my own name and do all that because sure. I'd already been doing it. Right. You know. Yeah. Like. I already made a solo record while 1100 was st still going on, and I'd already been making a name more for just myself um, through through that whole time. So it was pretty, you know, sort of s 
streamlined, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. And I had State Fair Records. We had made a record, 1100 made their last record with uh, um, State Fair Records. And I kind of looked at them and said, look, if, if you want me, I'm ready. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of songs. I'm ready to make another record. And I said, mm-hmm. yeah, let's do it. So and so we did, this latest one is our, my second one with State Fair. Okay. And it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's very yeah, cool. I mean, good people. Even in 
what's your what's your plan? I mean, like, because you're you're an older man than when you were in the eleven hundred yeah. things started. Are you going to take it on the road? Are you going to like give it the whole thing? Or are you gonna... I have been taking it on the road, and I content. I will plan to continue to do that. It's kind of an interesting thing. Because, well, because I don't know. I don't think there's. I mean, f- maybe physically for some people, get you get a age cap where you just like you turn into Danny Glover and you're like I'm getting too old for this you know (laughs) right (laughs) yeah uh but I'm not there yet and my kids are at a certain age now where it's just like I don't I don't have to worry about that as much Mm -hmm. not that I it ever really slowed me down in the first place I got a I've always had a great support group of family sort of pick up the reins with some of that Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, just continuing to record, continuing to write, hopefully producing some more stuff and traveling on the road, all that stuff. That's mm. what I that's what I plan to do. Yeah. OK. I mean, is there anything that we didn't pick up here that you wanted to? No, about? I think I mean, it's cool talking to you. Yeah, it's, it's cool thinking about it. I mean, especially coming down here, like I say, driving through the old neighborhood. I'll tell you something funny because, you know, we were talking about it before we started. We hit record and I'm like, whoa, what? building is this right. what is it because you you know i need yeah. to ask them because they they keep telling me and i keep forgetting because i know there was the J- honest joe's pawn shop because i'm friends with the granddaughter and that was not this like it was next door i think where which the, became dave's art pawn shop was, m- probably yeah because yeah. i think it's the next door where the the dog uh, uh kennel place okay is, yeah dave's art pawn shop was like the only place that kids could go and hang out like you know oh uh. and deep ellum and we would go there and we would drink like bottomless cups of coffee, which is probably what why he had to quit doing business. We'd just sit there for hours just <laughs> drinking one cup of coffee, paying for one cup of coffee. Right. Like, Get these kids out of here. Um, no, but like it's just interesting to me because it if you if you spend enough time down here, you've kind of figured, well, all these old warehouse buildings, it's like they used to be this they used to be that Mm -hmm. my wife and i i don't know about this is the story here but my wife and i i don't know it's probably about 10 years ago and our anniversary is in january and we decided we were going to go bar hopping and let's go to deep Ellum and just sort of kick around and uh so we were going from one place to the next a lot of these places we'd never been before never even heard of Mm -hmm. and we go in and like the bar tenders like a 20 something I'm like, hey, uh, did this used to be Deep Ellum Cafe, you know, back in 96? Like, dude, I was in second grade. <laughs> like, ah! <laughs> I was like, shit. Right. You've, you've, you, yeah, I know. <laughs> me, me too. <laughs> right. Yeah, me, right. I just was, I study a lot. Yeah. I was reading a history I book. I saw a postcard right, and right. I thought maybe this was I'm it. I'm really into the history of Deep Ellum. That's funny. Yeah. So it's just, <laughs> yeah. it's funny to me to walk in here. It's like, okay, well. It's not the tea room. Right. It's not, I don't think it's Dave's Art Pawn Shop. When I had Rhett and Ken here, they uh, Ken was like, we played our first show 300 yards from the spot. But I, I think he was talking about Profit Bar, but it was, no, it was something else before. Chumley's. The, Chumley's, that's what yeah, it was. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. I, just, I nerd out on stuff like this. I really do. Yeah, me too, except for that's, that's why I'm doing this. I didn't live here. Like I yeah. didn't, like I just got here, you know, in the, 10 years ago so i'm just like it's a special place i love dallas i'll say this much and i'll go on record as saying that i i really do i'm proud to be from dallas i think dallas is a cool city a whole lot of history more than most people know and uh and i'm getting tired of like falling on the sword for dallas just because you go (laughs) places and you say you're from dallas and and they're like oh dallas yeah no, nah, man, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, because like, I, mean, I lived in L.A. and I didn't know. I would never thought about it. And then, you know, Chef Music Showcase, that's how uh, I ended up here was because I started working on that. And like uh-huh. I saw like how cool it was. And I still say that. I mean, I don't care that Deep Elm has changed. There's still every day I discover a band that's amazing I hadn't heard of before. I Yeah, I love it. I love it here. You know, when you get right down to it, if you want to complain about where you're from, you can find any number of reasons, no matter where you're from. Sure. You know, no place is really all that cool. If you, do, you know, if you don't like it, then go someplace else. Absolutely. But, uh, but I grew up here and I think it's a cool, cool city and I love it. I love the history. I love that uh, you had me on and I would get to nerd out with you some about some Yeah, this has been great. Yeah. Honest. Thank you so much for yeah, coming you down. Bet. Thank you. I'd like to thank Matt Hillier for joining me today. You can check out his album, Bright Skyline. We've got the song, If I Didn't Have You, coming up. 
Thank you again to the Deep Ellum Community Center for letting us record there. Theme song, Unstoppable by Salim Narala. Thank you for listening. Please like, subscribe, follow all the good stuff and share it with your friends. We'll see you next time. I'm living, I hope you know there ain't nothing I want to do if I didn't have you.